Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Watto here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams, and we're going to be recapping some top pearls on an episode on adrenal incidentalomas with Dr. William Young, who was just a fantastic expert. And to start us off, Paul, I mean, what are the two fundamental things we should think about when we, when a patient has an incidentaloma? Like, what, what are the first questions we should ask ourselves? Yeah, I mean, the, the the first question is, everyone should ask yourself about anything that you kind of find on the CT that you didn't expect to be there, is, is this something bad? So is, is especially with the adrenal ones, is this malignant is the question you want to ask yourself. And you can reassure yourself to some extent that most of them aren't, um, but even the ones that aren't can still potentially be hormone producing, which is the second question. So your your questions for the adrenal incidental noma is, is this something that should scare me? And is this something that might be making hormones that could be adversely affecting the patient, even if I can't see it, are the, are the two sort of scenarios that we, I think we focus on the most for this episode. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And the, what I loved about one of the things he said about the imaging is, and and this came up on another episode recently too, is a lot of the times they're not really the the adrenal glands are just incidentally being looked at, so they're not really maybe let's say giving everything they could. So they're not saying this is lipid rich or <laughs> yeah. lipid poor. They're not necessarily checking the Hounsfield units for you, but that's something that he really cares about. So. Lipid rich adenomas, usually less than 10 Hounsfield units. That's very reassuring that it's not malignant. It's not a pheochromocytoma. So for those ones, he's saying you're gonna you're thinking could this be subclinical Cushing's or could this be uh, producing aldosterone? And so we'll tell you how to test about that. For for ones that are above 10 Hounsfield units, you know, then you're then you're thinking could this be a pheochromocytoma? Could this be a malignancy? And that's a different pathway you're going to go down. But for us in primary care, the majority of the time, if we're going to do any preliminary workup on ourse- ourselves, we can we can look for subclinical Cushing's and we can look for primary aldosteronism. Paul, with had you been familiar with subclinical Cushing's? I mean, to me, this was just a totally new concept. Exactly the same. Yeah, it's it's you hear, but for me, I hear benign. I'm like, whew. Well, all right, <laughs> dodgeable there. I guess I can be done. But then he, he sort of talks about. If you do have these functioning nodules that are kind of basically the way he frames it when he's talking to patients is that this is you're like you're getting a daily dose of prednisone, which I would not do for most conditions. And it, it yeah. certainly can have all the adverse effects that you might expect over time. So you, even though it's benign, there's still biochemical activity that can certainly, you know, lead to worsening glucose control or osteoporosis or hypertension or sort of all of it. So you're you're still owe the patient the workup because it might be something you can intervene upon or it might change the way that you manage things. So subclinical Cushing's means they don't have the moon facies, the buffalo hump, the purple striae, but uh, when you do the workup, the biochemical workup, it's it's a positive workup. And he said that's the equivalent of them getting something like five milligrams of prednisone a day, which is not something you would ever do just for no reason. So he likes to start with a two, it's a two-step test. You, you t- check a baseline, ACTH, cortisol, and DHEA sulfate. And the big pearl he gave us was if the DHEA sulfate is over a hundred. That means that uh, it's probably not subclinical Cushing's. You know, they're they're making enough enough DHEA sulfate is being made that you're not worried that everything's being just shunted down towards the cortisol pathway. If you remember that that big diagram. So, um, but if if uh, the DHEA sulfate is less than a hundred, he would try to see if he can suppress their cortisol with a one milligram dexamethasone suppression test. So. We get into some more details of this on on it, but that's what people should think about doing, and that's it. It has to be two days of testing because you you can't check. You have to wait for a second day to check the the cortisol after the dexamethasone. And then the other thing he just said was uh, primary aldosteronism very common. He he thinks all patients with high blood pressure should be tested for it uh, f- at least once because it's so common and it's so underdiagnosed. But he said for people with an incidental nodule. He recommends that you check a morning, early morning aldosterone and renin, and if the renin is suppressed uh, and and the aldosterone is at least ten or above, you should think about primary aldo- aldosteronism. And uh, Paul, anything to add to that? I mean, it's a short video, so I don't want to. We we go into a lot more details about what you do once you find that on the episode, but. Now, uh, we, anything else you wanted to point out? Now we leave, we need to leave these people thirsty for more. So if you're yeah, if this all sounds good to you. You should check out the full episode. Check out the full episode. We talk about treatment. We talk about the next lines of testing and uh, which people are going to need uh, their adrenalectomy done to to try to fix this problem. So 
click on the link in the show notes. It's a great episode. And with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you and goodbye.